No? Money! You got it. We are in Scottsdale. Welcome to a special episode of the Carmudgeon Show, straight out of Compton and or Scottsdale, Arizona, where we're here for the, uh, for the auctions. That is Derek Tam Scott, uh, optionally pronounced Tam hyphen Scott, and I'm Jason Sandler. Anyway, um, why are you here? Why am I here? This is your You job. tell me. I don't know. Uh, you told me to come here and I didn't tell you cars. to come here. I went into the tent and I just keyed all the cars. I was like, I don't like you. I'm jealous. Um, some of those cars are probably would enhance value. So if you notice, some of the cars, they left like really dirty and they're like, oh, it's a barn find. It's worth extra money if it's got dirt on it. Don't extra, remove my valuable dirt. Extra patination. We know, uh, we have a mutual acquaintance who uh, is a guy who's an enthusiast in the Bay Area and he like brings his car to car and coffee and leaves it dusty. It's like a... $750,000 Mercedes 300 SL. Don't take the dirt off it. It's adding value. Is it, does it, is it a license plate like dirty 300 SL or something? I don't uh, know. Probably. Uh, um, but well, speaking of 300 SLs, that's the kind of stuff that, that happens at auctions. But I think we should probably concentrate on stuff that people my age care about. I would say your age, but there's a kind of a confusion there. Is it like the 30 something year old Derek Camp Scott or is it the 94 year old that you actually That I represent? actually am. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I think, you know, for me, like auctions never made sense. These were a bunch of rich guys who were trading cars, who were collecting cars for the purpose of owning cars and making money on them, not for the, you know, not for enjoyment of it. I mean, and, that's a generalization. Yeah, Some of these people really like the cars and when they 100%. need to get rid of it, they're just like, I would like this to go away. So please come like make it go away for me. And As so I was saying before you interrupted me with facts and, you know, reality, and that was my impression until you come here and then mm -hmm. you see that everyone's just you know it's it's a fever pitch everyone is so excited about all these cars um there's barrett jackson which um you went to for the first time this i year. did it was a uh, <clears throat> it was a cultural experience <laughs> um but it's very different from the auction world in which i've existed mostly which is like sort of high-end european sports cars and so this was like oh hot rods and all of these like trucks and stuff and just the all of the yelling and the <laughs> the make America great again flags. It was a different experience I, from like going to Monterey Car Week. Well, example. yeah, so you have auctions and then you have Barrett Jackson because Barrett Jackson is basically a county fair. Yeah. Combined with a gun show. Huge corn dogs. Yeah, combined with- And that's not a, a euphemism. <laughs> they're actually like very large corn dogs. Massive corn dogs. But I mean, there, you can go and buy a uh, coffin like you walk through this tent and there are retailers and there's like a coffin retailer and a mattress retailer and then like flagpoles, flag a lot of flagpoles and then like MAGA hat stuff and then the the tents of cars and the tents of I think last year it was 11.6 miles that I walked just between the rows of cars that were up for yeah. auction. Um, and, and a lot of like sort of, oh, I would like that. Or like, oh, you look at the price that it sold for and you're like, oh, I should have bought that. It was like $6,500. I actually made it through last year and, and looked at probably, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 cars and there was not one that I was tempted to buy. Really? Which doesn't happen at the other ones. I, I saw a Mercedes G wagon, a short wheelbase Euro G wagon that had like 68,000 miles. And I was like, ooh, this thing, it sold pretty cheap. And I was like, that's, that's cool. I okay. want one of those. Yeah. I always, but yeah, there's a lot of like garbage stuff. Or, there's uh, a lot of cool stuff that just doesn't interest. Yeah, but there's me. also like a lot of garbage cars. I mean, I think a lot of people use auctions, even in the high end to some extent, they use auctions as a way to get rid of a car without ever having to look the person in the eye that they're selling some <laughs> terrible car to. That's, see, that's always been my impression. It's like, why would you ever send a car to an auction? Um, it's because you're hiding something. Like you don't want somebody to have the opportunity to drive it, to really inspect it closely. You don't want to look them in the eye and you want to just make it go away. But this is a process that I think most people don't understand how it works. Right? Yeah, I mean, so, so that's true for some cars. Other times people just don't want to be bothered. And so, I mean, but there's other ways to pay, pay someone else to make a car go away. Like, you I mean, you can do a consignment uh, arrangement as well. well I think, it. yeah, for example, uh, <laughs> there's also like a, a sort of element of public spectacle and they want their car to get a lot of exposure or sometimes with like estates and the family doesn't really have they're not plugged into the network of all the people who would be interested in the car. So they say, well, now we can put it on the open market if we're like settling in a state with a bunch of kids. We're like, okay, we put it in front of the world. It was a public like thing. There was no like funny business in, involved in terms of like trying to cut someone 
uh, out. So that happens too. There's there's lots of reasons. I, I think the, the two the two big ones f from my perspective are number one, sometimes there are cars you just don't know what the market is going to say and you don't know what the market was, is willing to pay for it. And there's one way to solve that, which is to show it in a public forum where the public is able to fight each other on it. Um, and number two is just to capture the the energy in the room, right? That yeah. you can this can bite you in the ass big time, or this can get you a lot more money for your car. If there are two people in that room that want your car, mm -hmm. man, and we know this from like you know non auctiony people will know this from bring a trailer or even eBay. If the two people want that car, man, you can get a crazy price on it. Yeah, which has nothing to do with the market. Right. Uh, not nothing to do, but which well, is very much an, an outlier yeah. from yeah, exactly. It's that one day for that one car. Right. Uh, and it's not as systematic. And of course, these are intrinsically emotional things. I mean, and we love cars because, well, I used the word love for it's it's mm -hmm. an emotional experience uh, for these people. And so they're not going to necessarily make a rational decision that is really well mapped uh, to what you would say. Like if it was an equity, like a stock where it's mm -hmm. like every unit of stock is, is the same. You know, not all of the cars. Well, let's be same. honest here. Stock is not exactly rational. Look at the valuation of Tesla right now. Yes. Tesla is worth more than GM and Ford combined at the moment. It's the most valuable automaker ever, mm -hmm. in, uh, American automaker ever. And by the way, I just was doing this research. It is uh, about 12% off of the valuation of the Volkswagen group, which includes Volkswagen and Audi and, B Audi and Bentley and Bugatti and Lamborghini and Ducati. I mean, this is like... Unbe is that rational? No. I mean, there's some future oh. expectation about the value in in the future, and I think people are betting that it's going to do, do well. So I think that's part of the. Yeah. the but that's I think that's the same with a lot of these cars. Oh yeah. Um, but what strikes me interesting as the as a person who loves shit boxes, right? My cars are worthless. My none of my cars would ever in right now would be ex would be accepted to any of these auctions. They're just not high end. The Mercedes. Really. Yeah. Okay. All right. So fine. Here's, I think what's happening is I'm 44 years old. I'm coming of age. I'm finally becoming old enough that or my cars are getting old enough that they are now accepted into these places. The 2316 was for sale last year. And I think it was there was one at Gooding and there was um, here in Scottsdale. But but on the outside, I know things, you know, in, in about I know too much about a, a, a small bunch of cars. Right. And I know things on the outside about the market that the sort of quote unquote market experts, i.e. the people of the auctions and all the valuations that come from the auctions don't know. Um, and this I find very interesting. So the I, Haggerty, Haggerty, who tracks kind of everything, it's their, their job. They have a their whole, business, literally their business, they have a dozen or more people working just in valuations. Um, they they feel like that less than five percent of all transactions of, of collector cars happen at auction, at live auction, at live auction, and that's a really fascinating statistic when you start drilling down into what that means. Because um, there there can be ninety five percent of the transactions for any one particular type of car can happen outside of the public eye, so we don't know what these are worth. Last year, there was a McLaren F1 that went uh, for auction in Monterey. Yeah. And there was all this talk about how much it was worth and, and what, like, you know, all the speculation back and forth. And I have a bunch of friends who follow auctions and they go to auctions and they world, they live in the collector car world, interacting with big collectors. And they knew exactly what the car was going to sell for because they knew the, pe the previous four transactions. None which, of which were public. None of which were public. Um, so here's, I don't even remember what the F1 sold for, 30 million or no, 20, 20 something, low, it was low 20s or high teens. To me, the difference between 2 million and 400 million is the difference between red and red. I like it's all meaningless, but um, yeah, but they, it had sold for exactly what everyone thought it was going to sell for. Um, but there's probably because the outcome was predetermined. I mean, honestly, like it looks like there's people bidding back and forth, but it's kind of like a lawyer, right? They tell a lawyer never to ask a question that you don't already know the answer mm -hmm. to because you're trying to take someone on a logical journey. This Whereas is, and the auctions are yeah. the same thing where this, it's like they have already figured out who's going to buy the car and for how much. Usually there's that's not always the case, but they're not going to go out there and just see, OK, we're going to put this up and we'll see what happens. It's like they've done a lot of legwork and research. Uh, in advance to make sure that as many po uh, cars as possible will sell. And like I had a customer once who had a car in an auction and the auction specialist came up to him as the car was going on the block and he said, I'm sorry, it's not going to sell before the right as the car rolled onto the, the block. And we were just like, oh, okay. <laughs> Where's your crystal ball? Like, well, but that, that's, that's the this, point. It's kind of a show. It, it is a show. It's a spectacle. And Barrett Jackson is like, there's actually like a friggin' circus in there. Um, 
but the rest of them appear to be a real auction. And, and I don't want to take anything away from them, but really there's so much legwork that happens behind that there are no surprises. There are a few surprises. And I didn't know, you know, I, as an outsider who doesn't live in this world, I didn't know that, you know, there are people building on cars that maybe shouldn't, well, aren't actually going to buy them, right? So I'm not saying that the auction companies hire these people, but I don't, they could be from anyone. So you'll see the same person bidding on five different cars and never wind up getting them. And you have to start thinking, who are they working for? Are they there to bump up the price for the seller of those cars? Are they there from the auction house? Are they there from, from someone else? And then- Are they just an opportunistic dealer who's like, oh, that's cheap, I'll have that. Oh, I'm just kidding. I don't buy that. And I think you get these weird f cases where you'll watch the value of a car. It's going back and forth in bidding from, you know, let's say two to two and a half million to 275 to 28 to 29, boom, sold for four. And then you know, like, I, I didn't know this until I started hanging out with like people who do this, they're like, well, that means someone else bought it somewhere else. And I'm like, why, why would you do that? Well, think about it this way. If I have five of these cars, let's say I have five, I don't know, what's this, F50s. I have five F50s in my collection and the, there's one at a public auction, so everyone's gonna see this result. And it's about to go for a million dollars too little, which means each one of my cars is suddenly worth a million dollars less. What do I do? I buy the one for the value that I want the other ones to have because now the last value that's on record for that car is what I need it to be. So I either spend a million over what the car's at worth or I lose five. That's a insane thing that you don't think happens, but does. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, look, and then there's the flip side of the whole thing, right? I live in a world full of Chiracos where everything is sunshiny and broken and leaking oil and has VW badges on it. Oh, um, all of that is true for these people as well, except for the VW badge part. <laughs> it's all leaking oil and broken also. <laughs> um, but what I find so interesting is that Haggerty did a, an article recently that, oh my God, the value of the Scirocco has gone up by 500% in the last year. No, but there was finally a public auction. This was following this. that bring a trailer car that had 180 something thousand miles and it sold, miles for, sold for 30 20, or 8, 30, whatever, whatever it was. Um, and I had contacted them a bunch of years ago and said, you know, guys, you have a $3,000 valuation on my car. Like it's worth a lot more than that. You guys should do some research. Here's the name of this guy, Chris Embry from West Coast Rocco's. And what he does is he takes Scirocco 16 valves, 16 valves only, and he makes like perfect Concours versions of the car. It brings it back to looking like absolutely brand new. And it's got a waiting list a couple years long and the cars are between 22 and 30,000 bucks, depending on what you want. Um, and they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, they're not $3,000 cars. They're $30,000 cars. And they, they say, well, we can't substantiate this. Yeah, there's one, no public data to right. support that. One of Chris's idiot customers brought his car to like good to, a, to an auction where it had no business being. And it just rolled up on stage as a tornado red 16 valve Scirocco with the wrong wheels on it. It was the wrong car at the wrong time with the wrong people in the room. And it sold for like $2,700 or some insult. Um, and Chris called me and he's like, I'm ruined. Like that's the, the, the value of record for these cars. What do I do? Haggerty calls me back and they're like, we told you your car's worthless. And we're all like, Fuck. it takes one bring a trailer car to all of a sudden, now Haggerty's valuation on my car went from 3,000 to like 30. No, no, but they just, the amount of information. Well, yeah, they the, just don't have the, the information. The quote unquote experts, and I don't mean them insult by this, right? That the experts have access to is so small. Well, yeah, because every car picture. has its own community and it, every community is really tightly knit. And so the cars tend to stay in that world Correct. and hang out like incestuously circulating. Mm -hmm. And that happens with the F1s and it happens with yeah. uh, evidently with Scirocco's too. And so if it's a car that's kind of esoteric and there's not a large number of them trading hands publicly, then the information is super imperfect. Especially uh, And when these you... guys who are only a dozen guys working on thousands of permutations of cars right. can't get access to that. They don't know even who to ask like to find that yeah, info. And, and no offense to Haggerty, they were they were really proactive working with me to try to, to, to help that. But at the end of the day, there are 12 of them. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of your make model combinations you can get. I mean, thousands, sorry. Um, and if only 5% or less of that is publicly available, how could they possibly know? They never could. So I find this whole auction thing 
to be really important on the one hand, because it does set a couple of benchmarks, but it's really important to understand the limits of that information, especially for people like us who don't have $20 million worth of car collections. Um, I don't know if you do, maybe you do. And you I do me. not. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Cause I would not be able to speak to you anymore. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, but from the, from an outside perspective, I find it really interesting to, to observe what actually happens and what it really means. And when somebody says, Hey, this car sold for, you know, the, the, the latest car sold for perfect example. Yesterday, uh, a Mercedes 190E 2.516 Evolution 2, so the big winged, amazing car. I spent a lot of time looking at this car because a friend of mine was interested in it um, for, for a client of his. Um, and I poured over this thing and it's absolutely perfect. I mean, the car is a brand new. Truly magnificent. Truly magnificent. And I looked at their. their 8,000 kilometers from new. 8,000 kilometers from new. Um, no mods, no changes. I could see like, I could see they replaced a vent that had cracked and a couple little tiny things, but it was all done perfectly. And I went to him and I said, I think this is like, this is the 2516. This is the nicest one in the world. Their estimate was 340 to $380,000. 80. Yeah, $380. And I'm like, they're out of their fucking minds. Never going to happen. You know, the, the rule is four door Mercedes just never worth that kind of money. I thought they were going to never hit 100 or sustain there. Everyone's talking that all of these auctions are down and collector values are plummeting and uh, it's just a bloodbath for the, the, the big Ferraris. And the thing brought $390,000 plus buyer's fee, which you Buyer's need to premium. Yeah. So the first $250,000. So, so the, there's a hammer price, which is what the car actually shows when they, it's going across the block. Uh, In this case, it was three ninety. Which was three ninety. Uh, there's usually a a buyer's premium and a seller's premium. So the seller gets, you know, if it shows 390, they get ordinarily 90%, depends on what they've negotiated. Uh, so they would get 90% of 390. And then the, the buyer has to pay an additional premium on top. Uh, and in this case, Gooding's scheme is 12% on the first $250,000 and 10% uh, thereafter. So the all-in price of the car was $434,000. Plus tax. Plus tax. And delivery. And whatever, yeah, and freight, uh, and then the the person who sold the car netted uh, whatever ninety percent of three ninety is. That's thirty nine thousand dollars yeah. off. So, so three fifty one. Right. Uh, if um, they had a standard uh, agreement uh, in place, which is, but it's fascinating because I didn't have the data points. That's a hundred thousand dollar delta right, in that case. It's three hundred fifty one thousand versus four hundred thirty four. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not even getting there first. I didn't have the information. I didn't know that these cars are trading this high. And immediately I post a, you know, my reaction is, holy shit, post an Instagram post. And one of the Haggerty guys is like, oh, it's not a record. The record is 454, whatever it was. Um, then there are two cars in the last couple of years that have sold higher than that. With um, less mileage. One of them had less than a thousand miles. Right. On it. And the other one had seven, uh, 4,100 or something, like 7,000 kilometers. Um, but only the point is these guys track all this stuff. Um, but then I got to start thinking about what you said, that that hundred thousand dollar delta like yeah. the gooding company just made a hundred thousand dollars disappear off of this car yeah uh, i mean yeah exactly well 85 but yes in any case <laughs> what? Huh? this is the part this is yeah, the part when you of go the, to the auction and you look at the like the building and the infrastructure and the people and the telephone lines Someone's and the concessions and but as a buyer how I, look, when I go to buy a car for four thousand dollars on Craigslist, I spend two hours tormenting the poor seller. I typically do a compression test. I'm underneath the car in their driveway. I'm on plugging shit. I'm scanning computers. I'm looking around. I drive the car. I do everything I possibly can to protect my massive four thousand dollar investment. And here is someone who just dumped four hundred and thirty four thousand dollars on a car they did not drive. They could not put on a lift. They did like. I mean, they maybe they did. Before. Depends. Like, yeah, like right. there's some opportunity, but if you see something going across the block and you're like, oh, it looks like a good, good deal, then yes, you could buy it with zero diligence. But if you're like, <laughs> a, a, you know, I'm, oh, you see that in the catalog, it comes out two months before the auction, you're like, I want that. And then you start like a diligence process right. in advance, which you, you can do, but it's hard to spontaneously make that call if you're like, this looks like a good deal, I'm going to buy this. Uh, I, I just, I can't, I, I, I And we saw that certainly plenty, like uh, the there were some cars at Bonhams in particular, which I thought were really hilarious. So they had, um, do you want to do this now? Or should we, there was some other stuff you wanted to cover no, first? No, no, we can. Um, we, had, we had a rough script of things we wanted to talk about. Um, um, the There was this typhoon 
which was like a Jeez, one exactly. owner uh, 20 or 25,000, I forget, mile thing. And it looks nice in the catalog. Uh, and then the catalog description has some where was it? Because Hilarious. this is this was it's the very last my lot. idea for this for this episode was that we should make fun of the way auctioneers it was the very last read lot. these like write these things like these guys earn every penny. So I saw this, of course, I'm thinking, all right, it's a 93 GMC typhoon, typhoon with just under 25,000 miles. One owner kept in dry desert environment for the majority of its life. Um, and then you have like. Where, where was it? Okay. Finished in a vibrant shade of apple red with a black, black leather interior, this GMC Typhoon has been under the care of just one California resident for the entirety of its life. Blah, 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 blah. First of all, then they start, according to the Carfax, you need to do better than that for your 20% of my money. But anyway, the truck was enjoyed regularly for the first handful of years. Enjoyed? How do they know that car was enjoyed? Maybe the fucking thing broke down continually. Maybe they hated it. Maybe their mom died in the Maybe car. Maybe they did. Who knows that they enjoyed it? <laughs> or they were just constantly doing zero to 60 runs, which is enjoyable, but not That's very true, good. That's true, but not, not a good thing for the car. But anyway, so they're extrapolating and sort of imagining that according to the Carfax, the truck was enjoyed regularly for the first handful of years after being sold. By 1998, 20,000 miles had been accrued on the odometer. You don't accrue miles on the odometer of a GMC Typhoon. You fucking put miles on the Odo. Anyway, um, before it began a more sedentary period. That means somebody left it out in they a field. They left it out in a field before it began a more sedentary period. Reported to have been kept in a pri pr kept in primarily in a dry environment, other than the grammatical mistakes. But wait, reported to means the neighbor down the street says, well, I don't think it rained all that much under that shitty tarp, right, to me primarily in a dry environment, which means when it wasn't floating at the bottom of a lake, this GMC is, in f is free from any major corrosion. <laughs> which, at least they didn't use the word structural, because then if they say <laughs> structural corrosion, that means there's corrosion elsewhere, but it's not right. structural. It's, okay. so it's free from any major corrosion, but its time in the sun, uh-oh, it did sit outside, <laughs> has resulted in patches of clear coat peel, which is typical of many GM vehicles of this era. Yeah. The ones that sat outside in front of your trailer for a fucking decade. Like, what is so, but, 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 uh, the inside the seats show with some minor wear from use, but largely the inside presents well. Okay. So I see this and I see the picture of the badge, which looks great. And the picture of the front end, which is actually a zoom in of the other picture of the front end. And the car looks spectacular. It's red. It's a GMC Typhoon. It's got 25,000 miles on one owner. I want this car in my garage right now. And you went and looked at it. Oh yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's some clear coat left on it, but also like maybe not so much clear coat <laughs> left on it at all. Uh, no, it, it wasn't that bad. The tires were from the dawn of time. Uh, no, they were actually just 10 years old, but they were like full like, sidewall cracks. 10 years cracks. like sitting outside. Yeah, the there was like an, a loose amp on the floor under the passenger seat, but, sorry, behind the passenger seat. The headliner was falling down. Like the, the interior looked like it had been through an oven. <laughs> it probably was. The dashboard was cracked. I mean, the thing was just thoroughly pre-owned. Yeah, wood rimmed aftermarket steering wheel. It was, it was kind of a roach. Um, and but that's sort of typical and of course if you're just like oh that looks good from across the room then that's yeah. the reason why you would like it's important to do diligence same thing with this there was this Range Rover classic that I really wanted when I saw it in the catalog because it was a, do you know where that one the was? right it was kind of in the yeah right there, there it is okay uh, and it was right, so like, hold on wait, wait, wait. what we have to do is make fun of the, the things <clears throat> this rare two-door two -door Range Rover you have to do it in a British accent right you can't do it in the, it's Bonhams they are British okay this rare two-door Range Rover comes from the final year of production for this iconic model completed in Land Rover's Sohill factory and destined... Okay, now you have to tell me where it's completed. Now I know you're... That you're means they like, don't know anything about it. <laughs> they don't know anything about it. They're like, oh, look over there, look over there. This one's at, you know, whatever. Um, and destined for the continental European market, this left-hand drive. All you have to do is say this left-hand drive thing. We know it went to Europe, but anyway. Remained in Europe until 2016 when it made its way stateside prior to its trip across the Atlantic. It was subject to a sympathetic restoration. Oh dear, you'll be okay once I've painted you. What the fuck does that mean? Okay, so sympathetic restoration means that they half-assed it. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> sympathetic means that the whole car wasn't done. Uh, which in a car of this value, which is like, I would have valued this at like, I think there's one for sale in Europe for 20 to 25,000 euros. 
um, I would mean, take to mean that they didn't f fully restore it. They just did like the bare minimum or they did some and then they were like, oh, this is getting expensive. Let's stop. Well, look, it's, I mean, their reserve, uh, their, their estimate was forty to $50,000 for an 86 Range Rover. I, I, I look at that and my eye twitches because I feel like that's a huge sum of money. Uh, yeah, they've gotten an expensive. Everybody sort of likes these things now. Well, but there's, there's no... ones floating around in Europe for 20, 25,000 euros. In any case, when I looked at it in person, I was like, oh my God, this is very disappointing. Uh, the paint was hastily done and had a bunch of stuff in it. it. Like it seemed to be corroding on the hood, which is aluminum, which is very surprising because <laughs> aluminum doesn't rust. So that was a surprise. Like the bumper covers were held on by carriage bolts. You can actually see them there. They just drilled holes in, the, in the, the metal parts. Like the, ga the rear bumper was completely crooked such that I could fit two fingers fingers in the gap on one side of the tailgate and three and the other like it was just Meaning like, like frame twisted or just I don't know unclear I was poking around trying to figure it out I couldn't figure it out in any case like uh, my like and I really wanted it because it's the like cool color it's the right engine it's a two-door you know most of those are diesels it was mm. left-hand drive it had it, yeah, it, it, like a manual exactly so I was really excited about it and then when I saw it I was like wow this is really disappointing and then the, the thing sold for forty thousand dollars to what yeah, it sold for $40,000 to someone who presumably never looked at it or else just didn't care. But you could buy a much nicer one uh, for 20, 25,000 euros in Europe. I, but that's I, sort of typical of this. It's why it's important to go look at stuff before you buy it. Well, I think it's, it, look, frankly, I think it's it's more important than than just going to look at it is to go have someone who knows better look at it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, so my assumption is that you know what you're looking at when you, but you can't always. I mean, or like we had, the, there were, I mean, it happens at all segments too. They had a Carrera RS there. Well, yeah, that one, that one, which, you know. Okay, so here's the deal. This is a 73 Carrera RS, it's RS27. I don't know anything about these cars, right? I mean, I know that RSs are worth a lot of money. I look at this estimate of six to $700,000 and I giggle because to any uninitiated, it's another fucking flattened Volkswagen Beetle. They all look the same. They're all goddamn 911s. I'm so sick of hearing about them. Um, but I know that people get all like weird. Have money. you driven one? No. They're really not. magical I'm, to drive. Of course, every Porsche you you don't understand until you drive the thing. Yes, like that's just the way it is. And I'm sure it's amazing. But I look at this car and it's absolutely spectacular. It's perfect. Yeah. So when I inspected it in person, like the, 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 it's, this is one of those things where like the value is gotten to the point where it has to be correct and representative of the way it was when it left the factory to be as valuable as possible. Otherwise, it has some value. It's just less. So the car physically was like in good condition, but if you know what you're looking at and the closer you looked at this car, the more you're like, oh, they did a lot of stuff where it was like, you know, when these cars were worth $75,000, which is obviously a lot less than they're worth now, uh, people were just like, oh, let's just do that. That seems nice. And so they did a lot of stuff that was kind of wrong for the car and it doesn't make it necessarily a bad car. It's just not a top like grade collectible. So what it's it, just a sort of used car. What so, did it go for? So 67 so, was the uh, It didn't. Uh, meet reserve at bid to 520 or something like that and they opted not to sell it I honestly think they should have sold it for that number given what I've seen in the market uh, for these cars right now and how many things about this car were like not right like it had fiberglass bumpers on it which was correct for the lightweight but this is not a lightweight car but it's, and it had lightweight door panels but it wasn't a lightweight those are things are fairly common there were other stuff that's really like esoteric details that people care about for these cars where they're you know, it didn't have the tools or compressor, or actually some of these cars had compressors. Others had a compressed CO2 cartridge that you were supposed to use to inflate the tire. Uh, the seat belts are supposed to have yellow stitching. It didn't have that. There's a certain type of washer that's supposed to hold the seats to the floor that they didn't have. I just love how the difference between a $500,000 no sale and a $700,000 top, you know, estimate price is the washers between the seat and the floor plan. That's I mean, plan. it's it's representative of something that like, what is the whole rest of the car like? Like, did they, it, it sort of shows the attention that went into the car. And if you're spending that kind of money on a car, you want it to be as representative of how it was when it left the factory as possible because these cars have crossed the, the point where they're just, how good is the car to use and operate and interact with? And how much is it sort of representative of some ideal that Porsche collectors have. Listen, I mean, the cars that I have that are in original shape, I want to be original down to you know the battery and exactly. the radio and the whatever. And, so, and, and those that's are because of cars. your own personal desire to have the right car. And Porsche guys, I mean, I think they're German, so they tend to attack, attract these sort of perfection-minded people. And frankly, also, they're a bunch of rich guys trying to differentiate themselves from mm -hmm. one another. And they say, mine is better than yours. It's more correct. It's more 
you know, this, it's more that. And that's kind of, you know, what do you get for the man who has everything? They want the ability to say mine's the best. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are the ways to do that. And it's, uh, that's, is obvious in, or it shows up in the way the market dynamics work. Well, look, well. also it's, it's a, you know, a factor of if I'm buying a car that is a legend because of X, Y, and Z reasons, X, Y, and Z only should be there including ABC and I mean, even, okay, yellow stitching on a, on a, on a seatbelt, perhaps notwithstanding. Well, but the other thing point, also is that these cars tended to be raced a lot or they were driven hard. They were like abused because it was a hardcore sports car. It's like GT3s now or GT3 RSs, you know, track days, stuff can happen. And so if you see a car that everything looks exactly the way it should, and you're like, wow, this one is really like somehow survived without getting abused right. and beaten up. Uh, and so that I think is, is it gives you the impression, perhaps falsely. Oh yes, that for sure. <laughs> that for this sure. car has never been touched or never been a part, yes. and somehow has always been. But if it has all of those things and it's a restored car, and you say, well, whoever did this car did a really good job. They knew what they were doing. They weren't just some guy, you know, in a shed doing stuff. Mm -hmm. It was a guy who knew these cars inside and out. And I have confidence that the rest of the car is really like well sorted and well resolved and was mm -hmm. properly done by someone knowledgeable. That which which all kind of brings me back to the that two point five sixteen Evo too, because what I loved about the car and we, you and I both spent a lot of time really looking at that car is there were just no excuses there was yeah. no this is missing yeah. because there is an exhaust temperature light on it that none of us knew where we knew that came from um, and it's probably a Japanese market thing um, there are a couple little stickers um, and little little itty bitty stuff like that that was added but nothing that seems to have been taken away and then added back in incorrectly yes um, which is is common right there's uh, you know that car for example had the um uh the, there's a like a lining that's on the firewalls a fire protecting a sound sound guy the heat shield basically and that was incorrect um and I, we were sitting there talking with uh, one of the guys from the Mercedes Classic Center, and he pointed that out. And a couple little, like, you know, little tiny things that someone did, but they were all kind of there, it, done properly. Um, so it was really, honestly, the, the uh, you know, the most original Evo 2 I'd seen. And oh. the market agreed, which was why the car was so expensive. But I think that also represents sort of a generational shift that's happening. I mean, if you right. want to say like that car is a car that kind of wins Radwood or has that ability to just be like a holy shit effect at Radwood. And we see there's this generational shift happening right now in the collector car world, which is making a lot of the old timers uncomfortable because a lot of the things that they treated as given or true uh, that that landscape is changing and the world is changing around them and they're not really sure how to react to it or what it means for right. the way that things have always been for the last 30 or 40 and years. This, is, this uh, is the perfect example is that here a plastic interior, you know, W201. Yeah, like economy a car Mercedes. Dollars, right. Um, and then the blue chips, as you, you, you pointed out yesterday, there was that 6.3. Yeah, there was a 6.3 at, at, um, at RM, mm -hmm. at one family from new, kind of a weird two-tone thing, which was not original, but like it seemed to be a nice car, but it sold for $32,500. And that is such an iconic, legendary car for people of a certain age, people like me of a certain age. <laughs> um, I love those cars. And the fact that it's somehow a 6.3 that was a nice presentable car, like cosmetically and, you know, maybe a little bit incorrect but just fundamentally like a good car that hadn't been ruined uh, sold for $32,000 like the, the landscape's changing and if, you know it's, that's a classic example of the Mercedes sedans not being oh also Mercedes sedans not being worth anything the yellow well okay hold on let's say I was always taught if, from every collector I knew like stop wasting your time with your 2.316 and your 6.9 um, because Mercedes sedans are never worth big money and that, for that reason, I was able to buy back in the day a 6.9 for four thousand mm -hmm. dollars, which is one percent as much, by the way, as this um, as this Evo was sold for. Um, but I so I love that the Evo is the kind of one that broke the broke the mold and says, "You old guard guys are just wrong. That you know, special is special, and it doesn't matter." Like for Ferraris, for example, you could never. You, you could never make money or you never do well on a four seat car. And, and for uh, Mercedes, you could Unless never do you were well. cutting it apart. Right, exactly. <laughs> to, and turning it to into use the up. motor in, in a yeah. GTO replica. Um, and Mercedes, so the, the, the Evo 2 broke that. Um, but also, you were about to. You were, oh, so yeah, so there's this 116 280 SE, right? The smallest engine, short wheelbase, uh, European car, which was cool, in this just obscene yellow color combination with a green interior with plaid and yes. it had manual windows and a manual transmission. It was just a super weird thing, like configuration with 32, 33,000 miles from new. It was gorgeous. 
and I love those things. I always have, but they've always been just like one of those things where I have interacted with them because I like them, not because I think it's a good idea. Well, and also, <laughs> like, you know, 6.9, which is the logical extension of the 116 lineup, yes, are worthless. The ultimate, so yes. obviously a six-cylinder base model is yeah. going to be even worthlesser than worthless. Yeah, and instead it hammered for $70,000. I love it. Uh, and it's just, what is in, uh, what on earth is going on? But it's unrepeatable. I think a lot of it has to do with unrepeatability, which is also these situations where you get a with no data available, you know, because none have traded hands publicly, uh, like the Scirocco, for example. Mm -hmm. If it's an unrepeatable car, people are more excited about it. And it's weird that we live in a world where a, a standard like Mercedes S-Class with the small motor with 32,000 miles is somehow more unrepeatable than a big Ferrari but from you know the 60s. What? You know what? That, I think that car comes down completely to its color. I mean, first of all, Mercedes automatics are wretched back in the day. So, you know, you could have a, a, a 6.9. Uh, wretched a compared to today's automatics. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Not wretched compared to the other automatics that no, were around at the not, same time. not that much worse. But, like, you know, I can have a 6.9 with a three-speed automatic that was, you know, a 64-mile-an-hour first gear. They were not all that fast out of the hole. Or I could have a 280SE with a high-revving twin cam uh, straight six that made all kinds of beautiful noises with a five-speed. With four, the same four-speed. It was only four? Oh my God, that was only a four in that car? I mean, but that's the thing is, so, you know, it really, actually the experience of a 6.9 isn't going to be that much greater than that 280. It will be different. And burnouts. Yes, burnouts. We'll have of better course. burnouts. But that color, I bet yeah. anything that the buyer of that car was young and not old. It was not some old man who's trying to repeat his, you know, his youngness. No, because was, all the people who bought those cars new are dead. No, I mean, you had to be rich to buy an S-Class new. That's true. And they were probably, therefore, they were probably old. But I bet that was some somebody in the 30s or 40s who was like, that is the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen. I mean, seen. yeah, because it's yellow interior. with green and plaid. Yeah. Oh and and the, the condition was just spectacular. I mean, it was like a new car. It was, well, there were cracks in the wood. There in was, the center console. In the center yes. console. There, there, was, there was little stuff here. Yeah, but, it, it use, was, but most of abuse. those cars are crappy. I mean, they, they are just valueless. So right. the vast majority of them are the ones that you see sitting in front of people's yards cooking. But, like, but I love <laughs> cooking. Yeah, like, Baking, I don't know, we're in, we're in Scottsdale. Freezing, yeah. I just, That's I keep true. looking at all these cars sitting out in front of houses burning Ruined. up and it makes me really sad. Well, but I, I mean, but I love what's going to happen next, which is that someone will take the data point of, sir, what year was that car? I didn't 78. 78, you know, W116, now worth 70,000 bucks. The market is going to be flooded with people with like shitbox 300 SDs or even so, worse, So I have a 280 SE. And I, if you'd asked me what it was worth, I would have said like fourteen thousand dollars. I think it probably still is yours worth fourteen thousand. It's an automatic. It's green, but not that. It's a different it's green. Yours thistle green. It's very nice. beautiful, um, but it is an automatic, and it's also low mileage. But yeah, I don't think it's worth seventy thousand dollars. That was the right people in the right room well, at the right, right bumpers, time. Right, right. I mean, those cars Minus, have to I mean, have yeah, euro bumpers. That was the right color. It was the, the right audience. Clearly, there were a bunch of people in the room. I, I wasn't there for the auction, but clearly, there were a bunch of the people in the room who thought that was cool. Much like last year, a friend of mine bought um, a 633 CSI in the most, you know, I'm talking about obscene green with green vinyl interior. Um, and everyone sort of, you know, 90 That's probably why they took this car. Because when I first saw this car in the catalog, I was like, God, why did they take this? I love these, but I didn't think anybody else loved yeah. them. Uh, but it was probably the result but of it's a, the color. It's the wow. The vibe of if the If I the were era. to have a W116, I sure I would like to have a 6.9, right? But... If I wanted a W116, it would be that car because of that outrageous color combo. What do I care whether it can do six seconds zero to 60 or eight and a half or nine or whatever? It doesn't matter. Frankly, I'd rather have the stick. I would rather have, you know, cranky windows. It had air and conditioning, right? no pneumatic suspension. Right. I don't think it had Easier air to deal with. Easier yeah. to deal with. And then that visual statement. Yeah. Um, and the I, condition. I love that. But I just love all the people who are going to think their 116s are worth, like, ridiculous money. And actually, let's hope they are because you know the the cream of the crop, the really good ones. Yeah. So this demonstrates like unrepeatability and quality. I think quality really drives like unusual results. Like there were a lot of cars that sold for like, oh, that seems like a low value based on what these cars normally do, uh, and that's represented the fact that it was like, oh, it's just another red one that's sort of like medium good and that's very repeatable. When you find a car that's unrepeatable for some reason because it has really great colors or really great equipment or really great history or something or all of those things right. that's when people are like holy moly like it's worth 50 like the people will vote with their wallets that it's worth 50 percent more mm -hmm. than all the other ones right uh like that uh, looks another silly example that r32 that a friend of mine bought so it was a mark 4 golf 2004 mm. r32 
with 8,000 miles on it. Mm -hmm. um, and 8,300 miles. And a friend of mine bought it on Brick and Trailer for like $38,000, I think. I mean, all in. Is this a blue one? It's uh, or silver. It is silver. Yeah. Um, but the car is literally perfect and it came with every one of the accessories that you got with an R32, like keychains and brochures and everything, just everything packed away and it told a story. Well, and, and find another one. Well, and, and if you have two people who really, really gonna, want that and right. you, they're like, I know I and can't find him, another one. And to him, to his, you know, in, in, to his defense, because look, by the time he's got the car home and it was already detailed, the car is literally perfect down to like there's a flaw on the bumpers on those cars where they get wavy and everyone replaces them. And this car had never even been to the dealer, so it never got replaced. Um, you know, by the time it's in, home and taxes and paid for and 50,000 bucks, right? $50,000 buy is a lot of money, but $50,000 buys you a current Golf R all in by the time you've paid financing and you, you know, and pay taxes on or whatever else. He has an asset now that is w worth a certain amount of money. And that auction is an outlier on the bring and trailer auctions that everyone laughed at. Ever this guy is out of his mind. Actually, he's just five years ahead of the curve. He's keeping the car, it doesn't matter what it's worth. In one or two or three or five years, I said at the time, we're gonna start seeing that car pull up the value of all of the cars that are almost as good because I firmly believe that's probably the nicest one in the world. Um, and sh sure shit, it started to happen already. They're gonna come up. So I hope that 116, that sale brings up, you know, the rest of the cars. I would love nothing more than a Milan Brown 6.9 with velour seats or some, some ridiculous thing. Um, but I think it's about time that our generation, okay, my generation and your generation, people who are under the age of 60 um, now start to have our day in these auctions. Uh, because we don't, our cars are not, the cars that we care about are not represented here uh, and they're not valued publicly at these auctions in the way that some of these other cars are. Like for example, Goings. Yeah. Uh, you brought that up. Yeah. So, they I mean, are, they're, they're I, I, having driven a couple of them. I will say they are some of the best driving cars of their era. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I don't think that they're I'd any be better best. than a, I would say of the era. I can't think of anything else from that era. The BMW 328 from 20 years earlier. 20 years. The performance is different. Okay, going faster. One of the best sounding straight yeah. sixes ever made. Yeah. Um, just so, magical driving experience. And in such an iconic, recognizable car, I mean, one of the most recognizable classic cars that there is. And we had, like, there were a couple of 300 SLs that uh, sold this week. And or didn't sell actually one of them didn't sell right. there was like a really beautiful one that was just spectacular and then there was a sort of medium good one that was kind of rough and uh didn't sell but honestly i would have preferred to have the rougher car i mean for me like driving if i could have a going um, <laughs> but but for me like these cars when they're so perfect and they're so like put on this pedestal that you can't use them then they stop being fun and it be starts being stressful i mean you have this even with your Scirocco where you're worried about it getting totaled like if somebody you know if a fly hits it <laughs> yeah like it's no fun to have a car to use like that and so everyone i think when especially like when people first start buying like big cars they want perfection they want shiny and they want mm -hmm. like the really exceptional cars and so the one that was at rm that sold for 1.1 million dollars or something when before premium i think it's probably 1250 after um that car had rudge wheels which add like 50 or seventy five thousand dollars. if they're real i don't know if these were real rudge wheels or repros it had luggage it had it was silver with blue which was not the original color combination but is like the iconic going color combination i mean the whole thing was just spectacular but i would have much preferred this sort of crappy one uh price adjusted the crappy one at gooding because it you know had the same owner for 60 years or something from 1962 yeah. to 2019 one owner Crazy. the guy used to use it as a daily driver the thing had like really just used up paint the, like there was stuff with it that was incorrect but like i would just be the guy who was like it's perfect except for it needs 100,000 more miles on the odometer then it would be perfect <laughs> that but like the, and the price differential between those two cars was was what 200? yeah it was like two hundred thousand dollar delta right. so the the one that was kind of rougher i think they bid to 925 and they said they were one bit away so 935 would have bought the car mm -hmm. Uh, and but yes, to get that car to the point of the other car would have been three, four, five hundred thousand dollars of rest restoration work. But you would never. Yeah. Well, so I the interesting thing about this one is, you if you want the if you want the nicer car, like you want the the, uh, the going to have as I have a going and it's beautiful, you're better off spending one point two million and buying the nice one. If you want the car to drive, actually, you're better off 
And it will be I mean, this is true of, of Craigslist dirt bag cars too all the time. Like I'll be like, oh my God, this one, this one is $1,700 less than this other one. And then you look at the other one and you're like, oh, it's really worth $1,700 to get the nicer one because it's like, it doesn't really have any paint excuses and it's got much more service history. And so like people do this all the time where they're trying to optimize for buying the least expensive car at the outset. And then they try to get, then they spend all this money to get it to the to point it where perfect. it's still not as nice as the other one and you know, spend $5,000 to make it not as nice as the one that was $1,700 in the first place more in the first right. place so the place where that like i like that the rougher gullwing is because i want something to use and if it's too nice you you can't use yeah. it in good right. conscience unless like these guys if you're made of money and you're just like oh whatever i'll just spend another two hundred thousand dollars and restore it after i've right well that's ruined the, it. the happy medium is to buy the one that's already restored that someone else has already lost a couple hundred thousand dollars in value correct on spending and and then start out with that perfect thing drive the shit out of it and then sell it this is only going to cost you two hundred thousand dollars in in depreciation but the cars will probably be up only two hundred thousand yes no but i mean well that's that point, the that's the game the, thing. the game is that's that the game right. and that's what these these old timer collectors have done and i think that younger people are trying to figure out how to do that with stuff like e30 m3s right. and like m5 wagons and cosworth mercedes and supras and stuff like that <laughs> i mean you, you were talking about me right i mean i do have a collection of cars that i drive I drive yeah. them all. I try. Yeah. I try my best to protect them. But at the end of the day, I don't own any of these cars for an investment. Um, I owe them. I own them to. For but the these joy. old timers did the same right. thing. They bought these weird foreign cars because they loved them, and then things sort of got kind of perverted as they started to the point where a squished Volkswagen Beetle with the wrong washers on the floor plan is worth five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that's the. It's got the, the wrong the, washers, Derek Tam hyphen Scott. That's why, <laughs> That's why I didn't buy it. That's why I didn't buy it. The washers. It was really the a buzzkill. It's all about the washers. Um, well, I, I, I will say that coming to Scottsdale is always uh, an interesting thing because I learned things like yellow seatbelt stitching and washers and, and whatever else. But I just can't imagine ever seeing one of my babies in an RM tent being, you know, with people slapping, like Persons slapping the door and sluts and uh, sluts, I just said. The door the door is closed. Maybe the door your slut. car have door slots. But. <laughs> your car's got a door slot. Um, no, but or and I can't imagine buying a car because I'm just too neurotic. But this is the. Would you have bought that Evo two though? No, you wouldn't. Have? No, because an engine rebuild is thirty five thousand dollars. And if what happens if it had no compression? Not to mention the fact that if you put, if you drove it as much as you wanted to, then the value would go it's down. It's bad enough. I, I kind of limit myself to a thousand miles a year in my own two point three sixteen, just because I would like which to preserve has like eighty six thousand kilometers or uh, eighty ninety thousand kilometers. Eighty two. I don't know. 80, no, 89, 89,000 kilometers. Now. It's about to turn 90,000 kilometers, 55,000 miles. Um, but I think I keep the car and I put as many miles on it as the previous owners did prior, prior to getting. So that car got, you know, 1500 miles a year. So I put 1500 miles a year on it as sort of the maximum. Um, and let's hope one day it doesn't wind up at an auction. I'd rather sell it to a friend so I can have, you know, visitation rights and I can come by and And, uh, pat it and the, the notion of uh, right of first refusal. Which yeah, helps important. helps with parting that's with important. the car. Yeah. Um, well, cool. Um, I would say to anyone listening, if you are if you are or you're not interested in big heavy, you know, heavy metal, big expensive cars, you still should come out to these shows because we are starting to be represented. And yeah, I really love that. That's heartening for me. Mm -hmm. It's really cool to see stuff where I'm like, oh my god, I didn't I think anybody that. cared in this sphere about these kinds of cars, and now they they're hanging out. But starting... it could be a bit of a curse because then they start to get really like commoditized in this investmenty sort of way, and then there's some loss of sort of the hardcore Look, that, passion. You know, if all of a sudden my cars increased in value by five times overnight, wouldn't change anything. Wouldn't change how I feel about them. You know what it changes? My goddamn Haggerty premium. <laughs> and your willingness to drive them and park no. them in places. No, 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 well, no, yeah, because no. you're already neurotic about no, not parking your cars what they're worth. It's only I just want to make sure they don't go away. In fact, if anything, if my Chiracos winds up worth $200,000, no matter it's what It's much harder to, to total. It, exactly. Somebody will be able to fix it for what I can insure it for. The only drawback is that my insurance bill goes up. Yeah. And I think that's not a bad position to be in. So, you know, as long as people keep buying... Evo 2s for $434,000. I can keep putting 1,500 miles a year, 1,000 miles a year on my 2316, enjoying it. And that being my 401k, a 7,000 RPM sideways drift with a, with a limited slip differential Mercedes with a wing 401k, I'm fine with that. I think we're done here. Can I sing other songs about money? Money, 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 money. Money. Isn't that the same song? 
No, the one I did was Pink Floyd. Oh. Boom, Mommy. Boom, 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 boom. It starts with the cash register. God, fucking kids these days. You know what the fucking washers are supposed to be, but you don't know Pink Floyd? That's not monetizable. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye, I'm leaving. I'm out. Fuck this shit. He's crazy. <laughs> Wait, so the bumper is comment, subscribe, and then go fuck yourself? Or is it, it's go fuck yourself? Like, you're supposed to like the video first. Okay. Comment on it and tell us how much you love the video, how much you love curmudgeons, how much you learn from us, how, how much, much you, you hate to listening, to listening to us drone on about. No, and then you click the, 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 the little subscribe thing, and then the notification bell, the little ding, 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 which means you'll get an email and or push notification every time we publish a Carmudgeon show or an icon or a proper current feeding or any of the other cool stuff that ECB has uh, working on. And um, then you go fuck yourself. Okay, now I get it.